Mummy, how do you make a cartoon? The process in itself is quite simple. Remove the figure. Take a picture. Boom, boom. Here we are. Here's a clap. <laughs> you take a photograph. Move the model. Take a picture. That's how it's done. It's done. In the world of animation, one nation rules supreme. <laughs> America! Since the golden era of Walt Disney, big budget animation has largely been owned by the American studios. While the Yanks won the box office, other countries got the film festivals, where they could show off their own distinctive styles. The Polish films are, tend to be very dark. Now, the Estonian films are totally off the wall, you know. <laughs> Lots of fish. French films, everybody goes, is that made by a human? You know, because they're so beautifully made. And what makes British animation different? <laughs> lack, lack, lack of money. <laughs> <laughs> a sense of innovation. So many British animators were born outside the UK. British animation is so much more than just kids' telly. Its bloody-minded brilliance can be traced from Victorian musicals to the latest blockbuster. <laughs> Even in today's digital age, this is an industry that is still handmade at heart. That's down to some unlikely pioneers, as extraordinary as their films. And we always get high on these markers because they're... Ooh. <laughs> These are the secrets of British animation, the story of those pioneers and the magic ingredients that have made this improbable industry what it is. You know what? If there was a secret, I'd love to know what that secret is. At Ardman Animations in Bristol, their original star is limbering up. For 40 years, he's pretty much been the handmade mascot of British animation. <laughs> Standing by is a specially engineered piece of equipment to make sure that Morph's camera ready. did the first episode and then thought, well, I've got to reproduce him again next week. Uh, and the easiest way to do it, the safest way to do it, was by weight. We bought it from the junk shop in 76. At some stage in history, I see that I've stuck a little yellow sticker with an M on, and that's Morph's weight. Morph was created by Ardman's David Sproxton and Peter Lord. He's designed to work quickly. He used to film 20 seconds of footage a day, three times what you'd expect of a fast worker now. He is what he appears to be on the screen. On the screen, he looks like a little guy that's, whatever that is, five inches tall or whatever, that lives on your tabletop, and that's exactly what he is. And I think there's a sort of honesty about that. Morph was just one of those beautiful creations so simple, kind of genius in and of itself, in that, you know, the whole purpose of, and function of the character is that it can become anything. Et voila. <laughs> Being made of clay means that there are some rather basic things that Morph struggles with. Walking, for instance. What I can't do is that, with, with his heel off the ground. He's not strong enough. So, he doesn't. What actually happens, in one frame, one instant, it goes from toe down to heel down. Like that. His foot has kind of gone snap. And that, that little snap of the foot, never leaving the ground, gives him a kind of a percussive sort of snappy 
snappy morphy walk which is pure morph i knew it was, I knew it was a secret somewhere that's the yeah, secret, that's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, handmade, and very funny. For Ardman, Morph is the perfect star. Well, almost perfect. It wasn't a financial success, really, at all, um, which, is, which surprises everyone, I think, because he's been a, like a popular success, a cultural success, but, but not economic. As a business, hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, never made, we've never made any money out of Morph, and we still don't. Uh, it's, we just love doing him. British animation. It's artisan. But lurking in its past is a big secret. Animated films started out as a way to make a bit of cash. Imagine you're a late Victorian musical impresario. All you care about is getting bums on seats. When all those acrobats and comedians start to look a bit tired, you need a new attraction. Enter motion pictures. A new technology you can project in between the usual acts. To delight the crowd, filmmakers like Walter Booth pack their productions full of gimmicks. And Walter Booth made it a kind of career of kind of coming up with special effects. He was somebody who'd done um, lightning sketches himself, the technique of, of going on a stage and drawing quick caricatures of recognisable personalities, people from the audience. And this was a skill that could be brought into to the cinema. Booth stopped the camera to replace a drawing with a real woman. He ran film backwards so that cotton would weave itself. And in 1907, Booth went one step further into animation proper. Can I fast forward it a bit? Because it's, it's all yes, the dancing at the moment. In The Sorcerer's Scissors, the sorcerer is Walter Booth himself, cutting out photographs and moving them frame by frame under a camera. <laughs> Gosh, that is clever. <laughs> Deeply impressed. It's a technique we now call cut-out animation. It, it, it does actually remind me of, of, of things that I've done with scissors, with collages. Scissors, there are sort of tools of the trade. It is a quite an artisanal technique. It's a very basic one of drawing. You don't have to draw a long sequence of drawings uh, and then replace them one by one. You can use basic cutouts. And it's a tradition that really grows in the, in the First World War cinema. Um, is really familiar to us through um, Terry Gilliam's work in Monty Python. <laughs> if you venture into the archives of the British Film Institute, you can see British animation's baby steps. Trick films that experiment with stop motion and even colour photography. Even in the most impressive films, something is absent. Authentic human emotion. When BFI curator Jez Stewart called up a forgotten First World War propaganda film, he made a remarkable discovery. An early animated sequence that, if you could spot it, had that missing ability to make you feel. So it's a film from 1915 that was catalogued as John Bull's sketchbook in our database. It was kind of what I expected. I could see that Dudley Buxton's name was signed on the screen at one point, and that's who I thought would have made it. And it was very typical of the time in terms of it was sort of pieces of, of cutout animation, fairly basic, uh, until I got to the last scene. The last scene depicts the German Navy's bombardment of Scarborough in December 1914. Dudley moves his hand away, and these three characters appear. And the time that I was first watching it, it was interesting, but it hadn't completely engaged me. It seemed familiar at the time. And then suddenly there was this little flash and a blur. 
and something happened, and I wasn't quite sure what it was, and I was just that little blur bugs me. So I went back and had a look at it. And what I found was these beautifully drawn characters had 15 frames of this extraordinary character animation that, that was completely out of place. If you look closely and slow it down, you can start to make out extra little details that you don't see on the first notice. You see that there's a flash from one of the ships, just there. And then you look on the coast, and it hits. There's a flash there, and that's when they move. Just this little, tiny movement, very human gesture, so that it explodes. There's a flash at this end, possibly another shell, and her arm moves out towards her daughter in a protective gesture. Daughter clings to her, and the son grabs up to his, his face, uh, the horror of the moment. It's something that really spoke to me and really it still actually sends shivers down my spine. These 15 frames, separate drawing upon separate drawing, would have taken a painstaking amount of time. Buxton clearly didn't think it worth the effort. He never returned to this experimental style. It was a former commercial illustrator on the other side of the pond who took this technique and ran with it. The American market was vast, which meant that Walt Disney could build an animation assembly line to make inventive shorts like his silly symphonies. Animators in Britain struggled to compete and did better when they adopted a more abstract approach. Living on a boat on the Thames in the early 1930s was a young New Zealander, Len Lai. He was experimenting with more traditional forms of animation. Marrying them with one of his other great passions. Well, I love to dance. He was renowned within London social circles for being this whirlwind dancer. and wanted to create the same sense of musical and movement interaction that you achieve in dance. When funding fell through for his dancing monkey, Lai had to rethink. And in his 1935 film, A Colour Box, he tried out the cheapest technique imaginable animating without a camera. He didn't have a studio, he didn't have a large crew. And instead was forced to go back to simple techniques that were achievable on his own uh, with limited resources. So he was acting directly upon 35 millimeter film strip. He was scratching on it, painting on it, using stencils to apply regular patterns to them. So it was very, a, a very physical interaction with the film material itself. Uh, if you look at the film carefully today, you can still see his own fingerprints, just as a, a painter would or a, or a sculptor. Lai worked with the composer, Jack Ellett, to break down the soundtrack so his animation would dance with the music. I think it's a syncopation in the way the music, musical instruments come in and out, and that gives Len Lai the opportunity to change the materials, to change the line, to change the colour, so we don't get bored with it. This is uh, the essence of the soundtrack. So he's not illustrating it, he's almost, as an artist, reacting to the soundtrack. 
By tethering music to DIY animation, Len Lai became a hero to struggling animators. In the 1980s, graphic design student Osbert Parker was improvising with vintage clothes on the floor of his flat. and hit upon his own way to capture the same spontaneity. Even though we're trying to make this perfect thing, and animation is all about, you know, being precise, I feel as though having this improvised moment, allowing things to happen by chance, is really important. For me, it's about using your whole body, moving these clothes around the characters and your work in the frame. Very much like dancers and performers. And so uh, I, I felt as though in doing that, it captures and it kind of records the way you move as a creator. Osbert tried out different music as he worked but nothing felt right. Only once I started to play different soundtracks with the film, I stumbled across a track by Bobby Sherwood. Getting back in the groove, we strut on down to the Dark Town Strutter's Ball. The Elks Parade. And uh, this track, it was saying something more about the characters, even though it wasn't completely in sync. There were synchronized moments, which I felt worked really well. Osbert went on to produce dazzling commercials for Nike and Budweiser. British animation requires money, and it does help that advertisers always want their logo on cool stuff. Back in the 1930s, Len Lai dutifully plugged cigarettes to get his film Kaleidoscope made. Even a colour box had to pay its way. The state, in the form of the General Post Office, funded it in return for a mention of parcel post at the end. John Grierson, who headed the GPO film unit, wanted the most interesting filmmakers in the world to work for him. As well as the New Zealand-born Len Lai, he secured one of the greatest names in the history of animation, German émigré Lotte Reiniger, which leads us to one of British animation's best-kept secrets. Many of Britain's most important animators came here from other countries. Len Lai, Richard Williams, Terry Gilliam, all chose to join an industry that welcomes free spirits from outside the mainstream. Lottie Reiniger first came to the UK in the 1930s, a German left-winger. She wanted to escape what she described as the whole Hitler thing. In London, she created films like The Heavenly Post Office for the GPA. She brought with her a silhouette style based on Chinese shadow plays. Even the angels are cut out, made from translucent paper. OK, so this is um, a puppet, a silhouette puppet in the style that Lottie Reiniger would have used. It's fully jointed. Black card is obviously the ideal, but if you didn't have it, if it was wartime or you were, you were hard up, then Lottie Reiniger, I know, used cardboard from her kitchen, so maybe cereal packets or powdered milk boxes. 
but it doesn't really matter because whatever's on it doesn't show up. It's only the lighting only comes from below and you just see the elegant silhouette of the character. In classic British fashion, Reiniger played to her limitations, conjuring up fairy tale worlds with just a light box and a pair of scissors. I know you cut your silhouettes freehand. Could you show me how you do it? Oh, certainly. Nothing easier than that. Well, of course, I make uh, some sketches of the of the skeleton and so, but the real shape is done by the scissors, you see. I have been always very quick with that. Like all animation, it takes ages. It's done very slowly, very carefully, and requires lots of patience. And working directly under the camera, she would have been working with film, so she wouldn't have had a video reference or anything like that. She had to work sort of blind. She had to work just with her, through her own instinct. If you make a mistake, the shot's ruined. So if you do a bit that's wrong, if you kind of guess a bit that goes like that, and then you're like, oh, I'll, I'll put it back to how it was, it doesn't really work like that. You know, you kind of would have to redo that sequence from the start, or else you'd lose that fluidity. How do you get the fantastic fluidity of movement? Well, I have the madness of making uh, it really frame by frame and making a motion with the things each frame. So that uh, this is a kind of thing which you learn by the time, like a piano player knows how to touch the notes, you see. Lottie finally settled in Britain after the war, taking citizenship and working here for the rest of her life. You can spot her influence in unlikely places, like the Three Brothers sequence in the Harry Potter films. While Lottie has become an inspiration for later British animators. She sort of encapsulates a lot of those qualities which we think of as being uniquely British, but of course aren't at all, um, since she was German. She kind of had that quirkiness, she had that persistence of vision that she, she wanted to follow very low tech and yet it's still possible to create beautiful work that's still meaningful today. How do you carry all these different movements in your head? This is so to speak the art, you know, <laughs> and a special gift, I can do that. In 1939, the whole hit the thing reached the shores of Britain. And in times of crisis, you sometimes need more than a one-person band. A ship which brings a load. A torpedo blow which sinks a ship. Animation had a good war. Suddenly, the state was paying for companies to make films about digging for victory and recycling scrap. 100 weight. As it turned out, diagrams had escaped rationing. So you look at some early examples of use of animation in the Second World War, and they're really quite dry. They're based around symbols and, and icons and, and ships kind of disappearing and a quite a diagrammatic approach to, to animation. But in 1942, a new information film really woke up the public. Dustbin Parade was a high-quality animation on celluloid, just like Disney, with cute characters and backgrounds suffused with modernist darkness. It was the work of husband and wife team John Hallis and Joy Batchelor. What Hallis and Batchelor did when they came through is through the quite familiar technique of anthropomorphizing animals, objects, they made the stories more palatable to, to everyday audiences. Well, what do you want to be? We want to be a shell. And a shell you shall be. Hallis and Batchelor were an Anglo-European alliance in their own right. John Hallis was a Hungarian animator, strongly influenced by the Bauhaus movement. Working in London just before the war, he found himself in need of help. He put an ad in the paper for animators, and that's how he found my mother. 
Uh, he gave her a, a test. She did a, a line test of a little ballet dancer. He never said it until she died, but he felt that she was the more talented one, and um, she was. Come on, boys! She brought her own special style and fluidity. She brought to it a, a knack for storytelling. She could make something difficult accessible. <laughs> Getting the public to pay attention to vital, but often pretty boring information, was essential to the war effort. If you haven't got a garden, go to your local council office and ask for an allotment. Between 1941 and 45, Hallis and Batchelor made over 70 films. They got all this experience and they had no time to think about it. They got on with it. And that's how they honed their skills, really. Once Hitler was out of the way, the government had other battles to fight. John and Joy were fully behind the Attlee government's radical programme for new towns, education reform and national health service. There have been many personal health services, but different kinds of financial arrangements. Morning, George. Morning, Charles. Morning. And so Joy Batchelor designed Charlie to sell the new welfare state to a sometimes sceptical public. The Charlie character is an everyman. He's someone that people can understand. And when he misunderstands the world, we would feel connected to him. And therefore, when he suddenly understands the world, we go along on that journey with him. When you're ill, you won't have to pay for treatment. I don't have to pay the doctor now. I'm on the panel. Yes, that's true. But your wife and children aren't. In just eight minutes, your very good health shows the impact of the new NHS right across society. Here, what's your opinion of this new health act? No use to me, old man. Animation lets characters see their alternative futures with and without the NHS. Oh, my doctor had a private ward at the local hospital. My parents made those information films for social security and at the beginning of the NHS and all. They really believed in it. It was, you know, the socialist dream. By the early 50s, Hallis and Batchelor were the country's leading animation studio, a British Disney. So they were the obvious choice for American producer Louis de Rochemont when he wanted to make a British film of George Orwell's Animal Farm. <laughs> but they were about to learn another secret of British animation. ...served in the archives of the BFI. This is the first colour storyboard. In the first fight, you can see that it's almost exactly as it is in the film. And the colour palette as well is pretty much like the... Alice and Batchelor's staff swelled from 20 to 80. Animal Farm required 250,000 drawings, 1,800 backgrounds and two tonnes of paint. Everything planned with military precision. These drawings look remarkably like the ones that they used as a, a sort of living storyboard and they had hundreds and hundreds of drawings stuck through four rooms on the wall and so they could chop and change. If they didn't like a bit, they'd take one down and put another one up. But one decision remains controversial to this day. <laughs> Producer Louis de Rochemont had secrets of his own. Silent investors with particular views on revolutionary politics. The CIA, no less. There is no doubt that they were uh, obliged to have a, a more optimistic ending where there is, as my father would say, a glimmer of hope. Hallis and Batchelor always denied knowing the identity of their backers. 
but they accepted an ending where the rule of the Stalinist porkers is shown to be temporary. And they were used to working uh, to the necessities of, of a sponsor and whoever was paying the bills. That was work, that's what paid the bills, that's what, that's what paid for this massive growth in the number of employees that they had. So they were realists. Animal Farm was commissioned to deliver a message, not to kickstart an industry, which meant that, as a British animated feature film, it would be a rare beast indeed. Instead of the cinema, animation in the UK reshaped itself to fit a smaller screen. When ITV launched in 1955, it created the British television advertising industry. They'll be in soon like a herd of hungry elephants. What can I give them? Emerging from this new world was a young Soho-based animator who would tower over British animation for the next 50 years. In both his commercials and his own films, Bob Godfrey had one secret that he lived by. You couldn't imagine Bob producing a feature film, you know, because you couldn't sustain it that long. His stuff was, you know, the, the, the vaudeville actor who comes on, says his joke and goes off, and that's it. Biographic, if you'll excuse the word, present the first do-it-yourself cartoon. At last, here's your chance to make your very own cartoon film with our free do-it-yourself cartoon kit. You'll get five Mickey Mouses, three Tom and Jerry's, six geese are laying, ten fat old women, one Brazilian country, four fugal horns, one Union Jack, seven little men in bowler hats, one Florence Nightingale, three admirals. A rear admiral, a front admiral, a red admiral, and a vice admiral. It was all about finding the best creative solution with the minimal amount of work. You'll also get one dozen assorted noises for use in any cartoon situation. These include a... a... or a... What was key to Bob's principle is if you could animate something with two drawings, you know, like one there, one there, and just flick it on and off, and it was worked and it was funny, why bother to draw, like, you know, 48 of them? But do you realise it takes Eight million separate drawings to make the lady's arm move from there to there. <clears throat> you know, animation is a lot of cliches. You know, how to walk, how to run. I don't, I don't do that, you know. Part of my ethos is that I have no patience. You know, I want to get things done. Boom, boom. The beauty of Bob's ethos was it could be applied to anything. Take the sexual revolution, something you could hardly ignore around Soho in the 60s and 70s. It inspired Bob to try his hand at that peculiar British genre, the unsexy sex comedy. Many people leave Dull, boring, grey, monotonous, dreary, uninteresting lives. But not my wife, Ethel, and I. In Karma Sutra Rides Again, Stanley and Ethel liven up their marriage with a laundry list of sexual positions. It almost starts to feel like a, a Looney Tunes. Yes. It's like each sexual position is like another item in the Acme catalogue. And you know, and then how they go awry each time increasingly toward the end. And yet again, paired with this gloriously quintessentially British dialogue. A word of caution, the crossbar can be chilly in inclement weather. Bob's collaborator on the film was writer Stan Hayward. If you were working in a studio at the time, 
you would end up in one of Bob's films, you know, sooner or later. In Karma Sutra, the guy in that, that's me, you know, the little, little guy there. So Bob always used to draw me with my eyes wide apart and, you know, one, one eye a bit boss-eyed, because that's how you saw me. Yeah. One unlikely fan was director Stanley Kubrick, who put Karma Sutra on the same bill as A Clockwork Orange. <laughs> Britain in the early 70s, when the next logical step for making a supporting feature for Stanley Kubrick was... ..make a children's TV series. When fellow admin, Grange Calverley, turned up with an idea for a kid's show, Bob saw how it could suit his style. Draw this green dog like this in outline. And so rhubarb was born. And he dived his nose towards the water and crashed it into the ice with a thud that could be heard all over the garden. As angry as an alligator, rhubarb demanded to know who had double glazed the pond in the night. Bob Gottfried was the last studio that Grange went into. He took it all around. It finally arrived with us. And I looked at it and, you know, we'd been doing commercials for pretty good money. And suddenly there was this... £2,000 for five minutes, I thought, no wonder we can't get anybody interested. <laughs> but I liked it. To make the money work, they created their own low-budget form of animation. First, first of all, we, we did it in magic markers on paper because of the economy and we didn't have big budgets. And, and we always get high on these markers because they're... Ooh, <laughs> I don't know what they put in them, but wow, you know. Unlike traditional cell animation, where backgrounds were kept on a separate layer, every frame of rhubarb had to be completely redrawn. I then flick, you see, between that and that, and you do get this kind of discrepancy between the, you know, between the inks, because they never dry the same way. <coughs> and this gives a kind of shimmering effect. Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, because that gives the film Vitality. That's, that's called boiling in the trade, and it's fantastic. That's show business, grid rhubarb. That's show business. The economic animation going on there. Felt tip pens, bright white pieces of paper. Yeah. This is stuff that you watched as a kid thinking, I could do that. <laughs> I, I, I could be an animator. It was aspirational. It was, it was aspirational, <laughs> but it was so perfect. <laughs> Bob did more than anyone to demystify the art of animation. He inspired hundreds of animators and was never above sharing even the most basic piece of advice. I know a lot of people who have shot a whole film with the lens hood on or no stock in the camera. So just check these things out before you start, right? Up and down the land, Polytechnics began running animation courses. And in the 1980s, a pack of art school animators were released into the wild. From Middlesex Polytechnic's graphic design department came Joanna Quinn. Now based in Cardiff, she skewers British life in work as brutal as it is beautiful. For over 30 years, Joanna Quinn has told stories from the life of Beryl a working-class Welsh everywoman. This is um, a scene of the new film, and this is Beryl uh, talking to camera. At the moment, she's talking about her sister, Beverly, who has strange habits. So um, she's saying she was quite weird, though. Was quite weird. Was quite weird. The animated films were still quite veering towards sexist. And then Beryl comes along, yeah. and she's a real woman. She's not a Betty Boop, she's not a Jessica Rabbit. She's more real than any animated woman. Yeah. It's superb. 
Beryl was born in a comic strip about a group of women who go to see a male stripper. Turning it into a student film involved a rather unusual field trip. I told some friends that I needed to go and see, do some sketching at a strip club. And then suddenly I had all these friends going, oh, can I come, can I come? And so it was about 10 of us ended up going. <laughs> But it was, it was a bit scary, actually, I have to say. It was a bit wild. These women, they're mad. The laughter, because it was just, like, mad laughter. These women were just laughing. They were having such a fun time. I think the fact that it was all women together, just totally enjoying themselves. Maybe the, the, the strippers are sort of irrelevant in a way. It was more about the camaraderie of all these women together. Um, getting a bit drunk and just just roaring with laughter and enjoying each other's company. And so that's what I wanted to get across in the film. <laughs> Everybody loves animation, so you can suck them in. And because people will just watch anything, you know, <laughs> so if it's moving, it's magical. And so you've got people hooked. And that's when it twists and uh, you think, whoa, because it's not what you expect. Quinn's superb draftsmanship often conceals biting political observation. Like in her 1993 film, Britannia. <laughs> So these are the original ideas books for Britannia. Here she wants to explore what makes the British... There's Britannia. ..so British. <laughs> this is a professional Guinness drinker. A teacher. There's a judge. Sloans, you can tell when I made this film. <laughs> Public schoolboy looks very Reese Moggian. In the sketchbooks, Quinn shifts from observation to vicious satire. There you are, that's typically British, just a, a conveyor belt of babies with corks up their bums. <laughs> the observation in Britannia itself came from political cartoons, Gil Ray, Cruikshank, all those wonderful cartoonists who were quite savage. So I wanted it to be more like that. This is supposed to be the class system, really, summed up in a cake. Funnily enough, we actually had a meeting with Steve Bell, the political cartoonist, who we showed him the original storyboard because it was really, really big. And he saw straight away that it was just, there was too much in it. And he told us, just keep it simple, you know, just keep it like one idea. So we just ended up with the idea of the bulldog representing Britain and then just taking over the world. And then ended up ending up a, a sort of lapdog at the end. <laughs> Went down really well, you know, it was a... The French loved it, <laughs> particularly. Everybody loved it abroad. They thought it was terrific. <laughs> but in Britain, everybody's like, hmm. Using animation to capture contemporary Britain had a big future. Across the Severn Bridge, the inventors of Morph had stumbled across the technique that turned their fortunes around. Do you like lions as well, then? Do you like steak some chips with lions with it? Not with lions, Andrew, no. I don't like lion steak. I, I prefer the ordinary steak. It all began in a Bristol homeless shelter back in the late 1970s. This was the location of Down and Out, an experimental animated film that used recordings of real conversations. Uh, Mr. Mar um, what in chat? <laughs> Literally, when we started with Down and Out, we had no idea what sort of film we were making. Our instinct was to make it sort of a bit wacky, because animation is wacky, right? But um, 
the producer Colin encouraged us to be quite straight. And, and because we were working with puppets, plasticine puppets, it had a kind of reality and an immediacy that was, that was surprising. Now, I want to go over and get a dinner. He said, you can come in when It made you listen to conversation and how inconsequential most of it is and how actually verbal communication is pretty inaccurate. Now, the other one, Captain, he turned round and he says, you can't get your meals here at all. I see, yeah. We kind of discovered this idea of using little wooden beads for eyes so you can move the eyes. And once we locked into that idea, suddenly the characters came alive. Well, don't you think you'd do a lot better and get better value for money if you went up to the cafe up the street? You cafe? Yeah, I think you'd get better value for money. Well, that's not very much help, is it? No. When a new broadcaster, Channel 4, saw the film, the art man was suddenly making a series. No, east. East, west. And, and, uh... But how do you deal with characters who are based on actual people? There was a kind of instinct not to, not to be too sympathetic with the real people. And we made the film, which was done for laughs, at a, um, a listings magazine. Could cut this part here, this whole lot. And um, we thought we'd really taken the piss out of these people. Better planning. Where's that the planning? That does fit on one page. It yeah, does. with a picture. Yeah. Doesn't it? I bet you that that fills a whole page there, almost. Does not. I'll show it to you. Smart ass. <laughs> Remember they. But they were delighted with it. Absolutely delighted. They weren't insulted at all, were they? <laughs> they showed you at the Christmas party with a great prize. Just tilt it down a little bit. Conversation pieces marked a much, turning point much. for Ardman. The adverts, creature comforts, which won Nick Park his first Oscar, all followed on from this breakthrough as they cemented their reputation with a certain cheese-loving duo, Ardman knew they'd eventually have to face British animation's age-old challenge, the feature film. It was obvious to us that a feature film is a, a semi-industrial process, and ours is a very artisan, small-scale process. So we, we had to build up. We had to build up and learn that you could do that without losing the, the warmth and the humanity. And once we, we found that out, then we dared to do it. Chicken Run, Hardman's first cinema blockbuster, wasn't released until the year 2000. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've been a wonderful audience. It made nearly a quarter of a billion dollars at the box office, and that sort of money talks. I suppose what the Ardman feature films have done is they've created a, a feature industry in the UK now. Mm. And that, in some regards, is a little bit of a shame because they all come up once. <laughs> you get an Ardman film, yeah. you get a Tim Burton film, and you get a Wes Anderson film, all stop motion, all at the same time. And this new stop-motion feature film industry isn't just the poodle of American directors and dollars. Get out of here and don't come back. For the last few years, a British independent film has been underway in an old speaker factory in Bridge End. If you think that sounds strange, just wait until you meet Chuck Steele. Asshole police, you busted. I suppose on the surface, Chuck Steele is a very American film. Just give me till midnight. Cut the crap, Steele. But when are you going to realise it's not 1985 anymore? It's 1986! But I don't think it's a film that could have been made in America. It's got a very British sense of humour, and there's moments within it that are straight from the pages of Viz. It's Americana as viewed through the lens of a dude from Wales. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you want a shot of the fiddling with the bollocks? Yeah. This one's got a special um, X-rated bit where he's got his uh, bollocks moving around there, so... Which does make perfect sense when you watch the film. It's not just a weird thing that I put on this for no reason. <laughs> 
Mike Mort had a rather specific vision. He wanted to make a schlocky action horror film in stop-motion animation. A massive task, which he made a little easier by setting it in the 1980s. I wanted to make the film feel as though it was a live-action film from that era, which, which had limitations back then. <laughs> didn't have CGI, so they didn't do so many crazy all-in-one shots where the camera's just flying around and you're seeing everything all in one go. It, it was more about editing and through interesting camera angles and, and sequences, really. The limitations of 80s cinema kept costs down. Short shots mean simpler setups. Come on! <laughs> Amid the hundreds of animators and model makers, there was some classic British upcycling going on. Our lenses were, were, you know, sourced from various places. A lot of them was eBay. You know, they just let, they just used standard camera lenses that you'd use for still photography. This was something from a commercial years ago that I've reused, so it's kind of came in handy that I kept it. <laughs> the car chase was a hard thing to get done because it took the entire length of the shoot just to shoot that scene on one unit, which is three years. It's probably for five minutes of film. Ah! I'm a maverick, renegade, loose cannon, lone low, low cop on the edge who doesn't play by the rules. There's no major studio behind Chuck Steele, Night of the Trampires. Just independent backers headed by entrepreneur Randir Singh here. It can be done, you know. You don't have to be a big Hollywood studio or you don't have to be backed by a billion-dollar company. <laughs> and you can do it in Bridge End in a studio with 150 people and $20 million rather than you know, a hundred million dollars that a lot of these studios throw at, at projects. British animation has always been hard to pigeonhole. Yeah! But now it is many things. World-beating kids' TV. Blockbuster visual effects. But its handmade heart hasn't disappeared. You just have to know where to look. You still don't need a lot of space for an animation studio. Just somewhere big enough for your camera and your ideas. Take Emma Calder and her studio in Brixton. You step into Emma's kind of studio home and you're walking in, in, into a world of just creativity. There's pieces from all kinds of projects just littered around the place. You're having a conversation with her and then you notice there's a, a lacy um, glove dangling in the background with a doll's face staring at you. Emma's shared, oh, sorry, studio, is an animation laboratory where experiments are constantly on the go. Playing around here gives her inspiration. What do you do when you have to make a film about Boudicca? Look among the bric-a-brac. Just noticed I had this like little um, little bit of broken china that I'd found when I was mudlarking at Vauxhall with a face drawn on it. And I thought, oh my God, that is really great. And oh, maybe I could do another one that looks more like Boudicca. When Emma's not working, she's still in her studio, messing around with a character she calls Random Person. I want a new body. <sighs> Here you go. They're a kind of excuse for me to just play around with new ideas, techniques. 
And like today, I came in here and I thought, oh, I found some nice leaves and because it's going to be autumn soon, I thought, well, maybe I'll make a autumn random person. So that's what I'm actually doing right now. Dead leaves forever, my love. It's the time of year. I see your lips, but they are shrunken. The window's shut. Lives past us by. Creative play isn't always fun, I think. You know, you're playing, but you might not be having a good time. You might actually be having a bad time. And in fact, some of the best work I've done, I've been really miserable. Which brings us to our last secret, one that you've probably already picked up on by now. Because in your town, maybe in your street, is a home animation studio. And inside it is an animator, quietly losing their mind. If you're into animation and that's what you want to do, then you're already slightly peculiar. I think, and your peculiarities show in a, in a very specific way. What do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to go to prison so that I can just be alone in a room and draw. So I think, I think what I was really trying to say was, I want to be an animator. Because <laughs> it is like that. Maybe from the outside, from an outsider's point of view, it, it looks insane because you're moving a puppet a frame at a time and taking a photograph for three years. You, you look at the careers of some animation directors, and by the time their career's over, they've made four films, and it's you think it, 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 it's your life going by. But Britain's animators have never just made films. Almost by accident, they've also built something else. An industry of sorts. You can do the ATS girls, eh? Eccentric, charming, entertaining. It's an industry that continues to defy common sense. But magically it works. A bit like animation itself. I think there's always a little bit of madness in having to make a film one frame at a time when you can pick up a camera and you can film at 24 frames a second, 120 frames a second, 1,000 frames a second. Why would you want to film one frame at a time? I think that's incredibly insane, but boy, is it fantastic when you see these frames come together and something that shouldn't come to life comes to life. That is magical and that is why animators make films. <sighs> Hands-on history gets to grips with six crafting industries made in Great Britain, available now on BBC iPlayer. And stay with us here tonight as the UK's most exciting new and emerging animators make their TV debut. Animation 2018 is next. Mm -hmm.